attendees are in listen only mode. Good morning. Uh, my name is Becky Robinson and I'm here with Marshall Goldsmith and we are so excited to learn with you today. Before we get started and dig into the content, I want to just take a moment to let you know about a few technical things with our webinar today. We want to have a conversation with you. That's one of the reasons why we've turned on the cameras. Um, Marshall, do you want to let folks know where you're calling in from today? Yes, I'm calling in from New York City. I have a, My main home is in Rancho Santa Fe, California, and my second home is here in New York City. Fantastic. Well, I love uh, getting to see you in your New York City home. Um, if you want to take a moment to get acquainted with the question panel, maybe you can tell us where you're calling in from today. I'm in my home office in the state of Michigan, um, and we would love to hear where you all are today. So throughout the event, we are going to be asking questions. We're going to be looking for your feedback, and you can use that question panel as a place to share your thoughts with us. The other thing I'd like you to know is that we would love to invite you to create additional buzz for this event by live tweeting. And if you want to live tweet, you can use Marshall's handle, which is at Coach Goldsmith. Um, if you have any other questions throughout the event, I will be here to serve you, and we're really looking forward to learning. So, Marshall, just a quick note. I'm going to tell you where some of our participants are. We have someone from Munich, Germany, Bend, oh. Oregon, uh, Houston, Texas, Missouri, Dallas, Washington, D.C. Looks like we have almost every state represented. Uh, some international ones, someone from India and France. Um, so we, we have a, a great group of people coming in, um, Canada even, so uh, well represented in terms of, of geography today. So I want to thank all of you for taking the time to invest and learn with us today. So one of the reasons we're here today is to celebrate the launch of Marshall's latest book, Triggers, Becoming the Person You Want to Be. And Marshall told me as we were beginning uh, and waiting for this event to begin that he got the news that's not been officially announced yet, that the new book has reached number eight on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. So congratulations, Marshall. Oh, thank you so much. Sure. And so today we're going to get an inside uh, view and be able to hear from Marshall about the content of the new book. So for those of you who might not know Marshall, I want to just take a quick moment to introduce him. Um, and I looked at his formal bio, and the thing that I felt was missing is that I think that Marshall is likely the most famous and well-known executive coach in America. So I really want to call Marshall America's executive coach. Um, but uh, by way of more formal introduction, Dr. Marshall Goldsmith is the author or editor of 35 books, which have sold over 2 million copies and been translated into 30 languages. He was recognized as one of the top 10 most influential business thinkers in the world and the top ranked executive coach at the 2011 and 2013 Biennial Thinkers 50 ceremony in London. So Marshall, thank you so much for taking the time to learn with us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. Well, we yes, let's begin. Okay, well, what are we going to be doing? First, let me briefly introduce myself to My name is Marshall. I'm from a small town in Kentucky called Valley Station, Kentucky. Went to undergrad school at a little engineering school, Rose Holman Institute of Technology. I got an MBA at Indiana University, a PhD at UCLA. I was a college professor and dean when I was very, very young. Then for 38 years, I've done three things. I give talks or teach classes, which is what I love to do the most. And I travel all around the world speaking and teaching, and I've been to 92 countries. And on American Airlines alone, I have 12.5 million frequent flyer miles. Then the second thing I do is uh, obviously coach executives, which I'm more famous for. And what I love about coaching is that's where I learn everything. Most of the things in my books, I really didn't learn in school. I learned this through experience of coaching executives all these years. And then the third thing I do is write and edit books and articles. And as you mentioned, this is book number 35 for me, Triggers. Very, very excited. Uh, this is a book I did with my friend Mark Ryder, who's fantastic. And uh, somebody, I have a funny story. Uh, somebody said, which of your books are the best? I said, the three best books I did were, were the ones called uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, Mojo, and Triggers. And then someone asked, well, why are those books better than the others? I said, quite simple, I didn't write them. <laughs> <laughs> these books, I didn't write them. What happened, these are all books where I just talk. And it's my content. And then my friend Mark Ryder does the writing. And he is a much, it, here's the irony. When he writes the book, it sounds more like me talking than it does when I write the book. The guy is just gifted. 
So we've done three books together. I'm a very good professional quality writer. He's really a literary quality writer. So if you read the, the book uh, Triggers, it reads like a novel almost because he has the gift of being able to write in that type of voice, which I really don't have. So we have a great partnership working together. Okay, I, let's That's go. a great story. Let's go. All right, Triggers, becoming the person you want to be. If you want to send me an email, uh, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com or website www.marshallgoldsmith.com. Now, what are we going to be doing today? Triggers. Well, what are our goals? Our first goal is to understand the key role that triggers in our environment play in impacting behavior. Learn how to help you and your clients, a structure to create positive change, learn a new model you can use for planning, life planning, team building, business coaching. Six different studies I'm going to share that show why the most important variable in change is the person, not the process. And then we're going to review new research on employee engagement and talk about, I'm going to share a technique at the end that takes two minutes a day, two minutes costs absolutely zero and it's going to help you get better at almost anything. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, that sounds impossible. Two minutes a day costs nothing, help me get better at almost anything. Well, that sounds too good to be true. I'm going to make a second prediction. Half of the people that start doing this, you will, you'll quit within two weeks. And you won't quit because it doesn't work. You're going to quit because it does work. Everything I'm going to teach you today is going to be easy to understand. It's all hard to do. If you look at my book, Triggers, 27 CEOs endorse the book, 27 major CEOs. They'll all tell you, this stuff is not hard to understand. This stuff is hard to do. Uh, now, Becky, one other question. I just want to be clear. What's my time schedule? When's we, my we have an hour together, so it's 10.08 right now. We have until 11. Perfect, perfect. Okay, are we ready? Then, what is a trigger? A trigger is any stimulus that may impact our behavior. So as we journey through life, we all make these plans. You know, I'm going to do this and this as a human being, or I'm going to do this and this, or New Year's resolution. And a lot of times our plans just go right out the window. Why? As we journey through life, we are exposed to constant triggers, stimulus. Any stimulus that impacts our behavior is a trigger, and it could come from the outside. It could be a thought. It could be a smell. It could be a sound. These are things that kind of often sometimes put us on track, but more often, they take us off track. Now, what happens? Here's my theory. I believe we generally know the person that we want to become. So if I ask you, describe the you that you would like to be, my guess is you would give me a glowing description of this wonderful person, person who's in shape, good with the family, uh, happy, hardworking, productive, high integrity. I think almost anybody can give me this wonderful profile of the person that we want to become. Here's the problem. Why don't we become this person? Millions of people around the world are disengaged, depressed, not achieving personal goal. I don't think anybody planned their life and say, I want to be disengaged and cynical and depressed and not achieve my goals. So what happens between this me that I plan on becoming and the me that actually shows up? Why is change so difficult? Why is it that we don't achieve our New Year's resolutions? Why is it that even the people I coach who are highly motivated, smart people, sometimes have real trouble changing? Why do we fail every day? Well, we live in a perfect storm of distraction. Email, cell phones, tablets, on-demand TV, movies, games, social media, multitasking. We live in a world of distraction. Why don't people do what I teach? I'm going to make a prediction. I am probably the only teacher you've ever heard speak who has collected research from tens of thousands of people that have been to my classes. And I measure, do people do what I teach and do they get better? Well, the people that do the stuff I teach get better. It doesn't sort of work or kind of work. It does work. They get better. Not as judged by themselves, but as judged by everyone around them. Why don't people do it? Well, years ago, my biggest client was a company called Johnson & Johnson, a wonderful company. I had the privilege of working with the top 2,000 leaders, all the way from Ralph Larson, who was the CEO, down to number 2,000. And at the end of my class, I were ask a question. Are you going to do what Marshall just taught you in this class? 98% of the leaders in Johnson & Johnson said, I'm going to do what Marshall taught me. 98%. A year later, about 70% had done something, and 30% had done absolutely zero. Not even one minute. 
I'm not ashamed of these numbers. I'm proud of these numbers. 70% of 2,000 people is 1,400 people getting evaluated by 10 coworkers each. 14,000 people have a little bit better life. I'm not ashamed of that. It's good. I got to interview the people that did nothing and say, why did you come to my class, promise to do this stuff, and a year later did nothing, not even one minute? The answer had nothing to do with ethics, values, or integrity. Uh, they won an award that year, most ethical company in the world. They're good people. You're, I'm sure, good people. It had nothing to do with intelligence. They're smart people. I'm sure you're smart people. The reason people did nothing had to do with a dream. Yes, this is a dream I've had for years. I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to predict many of you have had this dream. I'm going to predict many of you have had this same dream. Many of you have had this same idiotic dream on a recurring basis for years, and this is going to describe one big reason why we don't do what we should do in life. Now, you're probably skeptical. He doesn't know my dreams. No matter what me. What does a dream sound like? It sounds like this. <sighs> you know, I'm incredibly busy right now. Given pressures of work and home and new technology that follows me everywhere and emails and voicemails and global competition, I, I feel about as busy as I ever have. Sometimes I feel overcommitted. I don't tell others this, but every now and again my life feels just a little bit out of control. But you know I'm working on a very, some very unique and, and special challenges right now. And I think the worst of this is going to be over in about four or five months. And after that, I'm going to take two or three weeks and, and get organized. And I'm going to start my new healthy life program and everything's going to be different. And it will not be crazy anymore. Well, back at like people will send in a note, a question. Have you had that dream, yes or no? And then number two, how many years you've been having that same stupid dream? So if you can tell people how to send in responses, I'd appreciate it. Sure, absolutely. So we're going to use the question panel, please, and uh, answer Marshall's question. Have you had this dream? Are you sitting here laughing like I am thinking, Marshall Goldsmith just read my mind. So have you had this dream, yes or no? Um, wow. So uh, everybody says, yes, yes, uh, I've had that same stupid dream every day for 40 years. I had it this morning. Oh, Lord, forever to both questions. Yes, I've had the dream. So far, only one person says, amusing, but not me. Uh, wow, That's, I need to talk to that person. Well, you get the idea that most of us, not all of us, but most of us have had this same dream over and over and over again. And that really describes why we don't do in life. You know what I teach people? We think tomorrow's not going to be as crazy as today. Why do you believe that? I, I call on somebody and I'll say, oh, and how many of you have a job where you have to make numbers every month? Numbers. I mean, a lot of people raise their hand. And then I say, no, let's take Joe over here and say, now let's pretend Joe overachieved on every goal by 25% every eight years. I say, what are the odds the boss is going to come back next year and say, Joe, take a little break? Well, you know, you're working too hard. Well, let's lower those numbers. No. What's going to happen to the numbers next year? They're only going to go up. And then I have people raise their hand and says, I want you to repeat after me. My name is Joe, and it's always going to be crazy. Well, then I work with entrepreneurs, which is even funnier. So I said, I pick out an entrepreneur and say, well, let, let, let's pretend that you've overachieved on your goals. What are the odds you're going to look at yourself and say, take a little break next year? Zero. You're just going to raise your own standards. So in their case, I'd say, my name is Mary, and I'm always going to be crazy. <laughs> when you're an entrepreneur, you can't blame it on somebody else, right? Who's, who's a crazy person driving you? We're driving ourselves. So it kind of doesn't matter if you have a boss or if you're your own boss. The same phenomenon occurs. Now, we live in a world of classic delusions. Why don't we become that person we want to? The first one is called the planner bias. Now, what is the planner bias? We believe that person making the plans for our day is the same as the person that's executing on those plans. <coughs> well, the planner is quite different than the doer. You see that planner who's planning to have that healthy diet for the day. And the planner is not a hungry person staring at that chocolate cake. Well, the doer is very different than the planner. And we assume that the person executing the plan is going to be the same as that person is doing the plan. Uh -uh. Wrong. Second, the understanding doing gap. 
there is a huge gap between I understand and I do. The challenge of life to me is not understanding, it's doing. And we have this delusional belief that somehow if I understand how to do something or I should do something, I'm going to rush around and do it. Well, maybe not. Other delusions, it won't take that long. It won't be that difficult. Yeah, it probably is going to take longer than you think, harder than you think. And then the next one is the high probability of low probability distractions. Now, what does that mean? We never plan on low probability distractions. We don't plan on somebody getting sick or a car wreck or a flat tire because the odds on any of these things happening are quite low. Here's the problem. There are a million low probability things that can occur. And while the odds on any one of them occurring may be quite low, the odds on something occurring are almost certain. When I coach executives, I tell them, I'm going to work with you for 18 months. I probably could do it in a year instead of 18 months, but the problem is you're going to have a crisis. And then they always ask me, well, what crisis? I, say, I don't know. Some crisis. There's always a crisis. Somebody dies. Some kid has a problem. The company gets bought. The company gets sold. I said, I don't know what the crisis is going to be, but take my word for it. I've never coached a person in my life for 18 months that did not have a crisis. There's always a crisis, but we don't plan on it. We constantly are barraged by triggers that take us away from our goals. We believe, I have the wisdom to objectively evaluate my own behavior. No, we don't. We do not have the wisdom to objectively evaluate our own behavior. I have asked 80,000 people a question. How many of you think you're in the top 10% of your professional group? 70% of us believe we're in the top 10, 82% of us believe we're in the top 20, and 98.5% of us believe we're in the top half. This is not a theory, this is a fact. And the more successful we become, we get. Why? The higher up you are, everybody kisses your butt, they laugh at your jokes, ho, ho, ho. they pretend you're smart. After a while, it gets harder and harder to understand what's real. We believe we have the courage to regularly monitor our own behavior. Well, not so much. We really do not have the courage to monitor our own behavior. Um, I pay somebody every day, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, to call me on the phone just to make sure that I monitor my own behavior. Why do I pay somebody to do that every day? Well, if I had the courage to do it myself, I would. I don't have the courage to do it myself. If I did, I would. I don't have that level of courage. That's why I pay somebody to call me on the phone every day. And then finally, this is one I'll spend some time on. We believe I don't need help or structure to become the person I want to be. I don't need help and structure. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We often need a lot more help and structure than we want to admit. And we tend to deify willpower. You know, he can achieve on his own or they did it on their own. And we put down people that need help and need structure. We all need help and structure. And one thing I'm proud of as an executive coach, and Becky, you're probably too young to remember this, but coaching used to be something that was really seen for losers. It was for people that had problems. And one thing I'm very proud of is making coaching stuff that's good for winners. And I'm very proud of the fact that 27 CEOs endorsed my book and they all said I'm their coach. They're not ashamed to have a coach. Well, the top 10 tennis players all have coaches. Every Hollywood movie star has a personal trainer that comes to their house every day to help them. Why? They know how to work out. They know it's important. They know how to use the stupid machine. Why do they pay someone every day? Because they are smart enough to realize they're not going to do it on their own. They need help. And it's okay. It's okay. For many people, I ask them, for example, do you need to be a better listener? And they'll say yes. I'll say, how many years have you needed to be a better listener? Forty. Then I'll say, well, repeat after me. My name is Jane. I need to be a better listener. I have not fixed this by myself in 40 years. It's highly unlikely I'm going to fix it by myself next year. Hmm. Well, why should we believe we're going to change ourselves? when we haven't done it for 40 years. We're not. And the key is just don't be ashamed to get help. And if you get help, you're much more likely to get better. Now, the evolution of my coaching. And this is what led to the book Triggers. I used to be, as a coach, arrogant enough to think that people got better largely because of me. 
And then I do this pay for results thing, so I don't get paid if my clients don't get better. And after a while, a couple of times I didn't get paid. I thought, well, that's not good. Maybe the key variable is not just me. I realize it's much more about the person I'm coaching. And now, though, I realize it's not just about me and the person. It's about the environment. Let me give you an extreme negative example. Uh, a person is a drug addict. They go to rehab. They get better. And they really are sincere. This person is really sincere. They want to get better. They think it's important. What happens, though, if they get put back in exactly the same environment that they came from? In the huge majority of cases, the triggers in the environment are so strong that even the best meaning person will relapse. They're going to become the drug addict they used to be. They become the person they used to be, not the person they want to be. Why? The triggers in the environment start controlling us as opposed to us controlling them. Now, when I interview my coaching clients, I used to ask uh, three questions to everyone around my client. What's the person doing well? What do they... Uh, what does this person need to do better? And imagine your mentor, coach, or advisor for this person. What advice would you have? Well, now I had added a couple of new questions. Describe the environment that brings out the best in this person, and describe the environment that brings out the worst in this person. What I've learned by adding these questions in my coaching is I learn how the outside is impacting the client. And sometimes it's not that they're a bad listener, they're a bad listener in these types of situations or sometimes they're really good at recognition in this environment, but not in that environment. So it helps me understand how the environment is influencing the person. Now, previous work on employee engagement. I'm a fellow of something called the National Academy of Human Resources. This is top HR people around the world, or mostly in the United States, excuse me. And they're mostly heads of HR big organizations. But occasionally they toss in a few outside consultants, me, David Ulrich, and Ram Jaron, a few. And I was listening to a presentation, and the topic was employee engagement. Employee engagement. And this was three of the top HR people in America, and the presentation was very positive. People talked about recognition, reward program, compensation, empowerment. Then they said, in spite of all previous efforts, global employee engagement is near an all-time low. As I listened, I realized something. 100% of the dialogue was, what can the company do to engage you? And absolutely zero percent was what can you do to engage yourself. And I'm not exaggerating. Hundred to zero. Reminded me of the famous speech John Kennedy made upon his inauguration. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for the country. This was 100 percent the opposite of the John Kennedy speech. Now, I'm always flying on an airplane. I'm on a three-hour flight on American Airlines. One flight attendant is positive, motivated, upbeat, enthusiastic. One is negative, bitter, angry, and cynical. Well, they're on the same plane, same pay, same uniform, same employee engagement program. What is the difference? The difference is not what's on the outside. The difference is what's on the inside. The difference is not what's on the outside. The difference is what's on the inside. And that really got me thinking about how can we start taking responsibility for our own engagement? And as I look at this, that led me to doing a whole lot of different research. And I'm going to talk about six different studies. Well, first, the Great Western Disease, which has led to a lot of this. The Great Western Disease is, um, I'll be happy when. I will be happy when. When I get the money, the status, the BMW, the condominium, I will be happy when. What is the Great Western Art Form? The Great Western Art Form sounds like this. There's a person, the person is sad. The person spends money, they buy a product, and they become happy. Mm -hmm. this, this is called a commercial. I don't know if you've ever heard of one of those before, but in our lives, we are bombarded with this message over and over. I will be happy when. And how does this impact employee engagement? Well, the great engagement myth, employees will be engaged when. When we give them a pay raise or when we give them... Uh, Blue Jean Friday. Not really. Today's gift is tomorrow's expectation. If you give someone something, and that's nice, and it might be motivational for a while, it's three years later. It's no longer motivational. Today's gift is tomorrow's expectation. Well, two simple definitions as we journey through life. The first is fate. What is our fate? Fate is the hand of cards that we've been dealt. 
for example, the past. At this second in time, you have been dealt a hand of cards. Fate is what we cannot change in life. Choice is how we play the hand of cards we've been dealt. And although we may not be able to change fate, we always have choice. That is what we can control. And as we journey through life, we live in a world of mutual creation. What is mutual creation? I am creating my world, and at the same time, triggers in my world are creating me. We often don't think about how we are being created by the world around us. We are creating the world, and at that very same time, the world around us is creating us. Now, the value of structure in maintaining change. There's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto, published by Dr. Atul Gawande at Harvard Medical School. Fantastic book. In his book, he makes a point that you can't argue with. If the nurse asks the surgeon a series of very simple questions from a checklist before the surgery, the odds on unneeded infection plummet, and the death rate because of unnecessary infection is cut by two-thirds. By the way, this is not a theory. This is a fact. The huge majority of hospitals around the world do not allow the nurse to ask the doctor the question. Why? Ego. According to Dr. Gawande, most people have died because of the egos of surgeons and died in the Vietnam War, the Afghan War, and the Iraqi War combined. Another great example of structure is my friend Alan Mulally. Alan Mulally had the privilege of, in theory, I was his coach in practice. I learned 10 times from him what he learned from me. Alan Mulally was ranked the number three greatest leader in the world last year, behind only the Pope and Angela Merkel in Fortune magazine, and deserved it. Totally turned around the Ford Motor Company. What did he do? He provided clear, simple structure. He said, here's how we're going to treat each other. Here's the way we're going to operate as a team. Here's the way we're going to work. A couple of people didn't like it. And one of the executive vice presidents goes to Bill Ford and says, this is nonsense. It's childish. I don't need this kind of stuff. It feels like I'm a Boy Scout. He said, I'm no longer the CEO. Go talk to Alan. Alan said, well, this is the way we're going to treat each other. And we're going to do this every week. I said, this is childish, I don't need this. Alan looked at him and said, I made a choice, you made a choice, goodbye. Second guy challenges him, I made a choice, you made a choice, goodbye. After that, 14 of the 16 people that led Ford to bankruptcy were the same people who turned the company around. He only got rid of two people on the management team. And by the way, they both opted out because they were too proud. <laughs> Unfortunately for them, given the fact the stock went from 1 to 18.4, they also opted out of making tens of millions of dollars because of their pride. Well, with my own clients, I use something called the six-question coaching process. And I don't have time to get into it, but send me an email. I'll send it to you. It's a simple structure that I use to help my clients keep on track. It's a simple, focused structure and just huge positive results. And in my own coaching practice, we have something called stakeholder-centered coaching. We have certified 1,300 people to be coaches. One of the top coaches in our network is a gentleman named Chris Coffey, probably on paper the least qualified coach in the whole network. Incredibly effective. Why? Clear structure. He follows guidelines. And he gets results. Now, as we journey through life, this is a little model that hopefully helps you become the person that you want to be. This is called the wheel of change. If you look at the wheel of change, two dimensions, positive, negative. And if you look at the other dimension, And if you look at the other dimension, it says change and keep. The wheel of change. Huh. Yes, Becky? Oh, well, I thought we might be having trouble with your audio, but we're good. Thanks, Hello. Marshall. Marshall? Okay. Yes, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, very good. Then positive, negative, keep, change. Four quadrants in the wheel of change. The first one's called creating. Creating is, if we look at and we want to become in the future, who is the me that I want to become? Who is this me I want to become? What is a positive change I want to create? The second one is preserving. As we plan the, our lives, what is it about my life I want to keep or preserve? Uh, the third one is eliminating. What do I need to get rid of? And then finally, the fourth one is accepting. What do I need to just accept or make peace with? The wheel of change. Now, we're going to start by looking at creating. Who is the you that you want to become? I'm going to ask her to send in some messages to, to Becky. 
a good place to start is to look at how you define yourself now. What's your identity today? And then look at who's the me I want to be in the future? How do I want to be different? And we often stereotype ourselves. One of the reasons we don't change is we put ourselves in stereotypical boxes. I can't listen. I've never been able to listen. I can't listen. I'm no good at recognition. We make these comments about ourselves. And a lot of these comments come from programs in our lives that have really not much basis in logic, that they're sometimes decades old. Now, I didn't have a brother or sister, and my wife didn't have a brother or sister. And so we really didn't understand the importance of siblings. Now that I've been working on people's identity to try to help them, I realize how important our siblings are in terms of establishing our identity. For example, uh, she's the pretty one. She's the ugly one. He's the smart one. He's the stupid one. Oh, yeah, he's the hard worker. He's the lazy one. We've all been given these identities or programs, and it is amazing how they influence our lives in positive and negative ways. And they really can either help us or inhibit us in becoming the person we want to become. Let me give you an example that sounds positive. It sounds positive, yet even this positive example has a dark side. I was teaching at a class in a hospital, and I just randomly said, how many of you were brought up to believe you were the responsible one? 100% of the people in the room raised their hands. They were all brought up to believe they were the responsible one. And we talked about it. And there's a lot of good that came from that. Obviously, a lot of them were medical doctors, very nurses, really good people. But then I said, is there a negative to that? It was interesting. Several people started crying. One woman said, I always have to be responsible. My brothers and sisters got to have all the fun. They didn't have to worry about getting things done because they knew they could count on me. Well, it was interesting. And as I talked about this, looking at the person they wanted to be in the future, it's not that they wanted to be always irresponsible. Maybe they didn't always have to be responsible. The smart one. Maybe you don't always have to prove how smart you are. The funny one. Maybe you don't always have to be funny. So looking at the future, think about how do I define myself? Who do I want to be in the future? And how is that new me different than the old me? Now, Becky, what I'd like to do is I'd like people to just send in, um, who were you brought up to believe you were? And, and I'd like them to say, like, the smart one, the clever one, the responsible one, whatever. And then say, uh, uh, let's leave out the positives now. What's one element of that that maybe is not so positive, that is something you don't want to carry around? So if everybody can, what were you brought up to believe you were? Smart one, clever one, pretty one, responsible one, stupid one, whatever it is, send it in, and then say, what's one element of that moving forward that you might want to change a little bit, modify to create the new person you want to be? Are you getting any responses yet? I am starting to get some. Uh, so, so far I have some folks who are the responsible one, uh, the rule follower, um, the questioning one, uh, the good one, uh, the special one, the smart one, the strong one. Um, huh, interesting, the feeling one. Uh, a lot of responsible ones, people identify with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's a couple negative ones, Marshall. The lazy and not intelligent enough one. That's yeah. uh, painful. Uh, the different one. So lots of great responses. And uh, folks are talking about um, you know, needing to take responsibility, perhaps even when they shouldn't. Um, let's guilt. see. Yeah, a, lo a lot of guilt coming here for sure. A lot of guilt mm -hmm. because you're responsible if there's a problem, whose fault is it? Yours. Because mm -hmm. you're the responsible one. <laughs> I have one for you, Marshall. Mine is the spoiled one. I was the youngest sister, you know. <laughs> that is funny. And, you know, a lot of good and obviously not awful. You're a successful person. On the other hand, you can think back on it and say, you know, there are times I still like spoiled. <laughs> yeah, or I want to be spoiled still. Um, so spoiled, here's yeah. something from uh, someone who once uh, was known as the smart one and then feels pressure to always have the answers. That's a great one. 
let me give you a real case study about this. And one of the people I coach is Dr. Jim Kim. Dr. Jim is the president of the bank. In terms of the smart one, uh, he's a simultaneous MD and PhD with honors from Harvard in anthropology in five years. Now, I want you to think about that. A normal human to get a PhD in anthropology from Harvard takes eight years. He got one in five years and picked up an MD at the same time. So when the brains were passed out, old Dr. Jim was not standing near the back of the line. First time I interviewed Dr. Jim, I'm taking notes. And after an hour, I said, Dr. Jim, let me read this back to you. Here's six times in the last hour you have told me how smart you were. Six times. He was so embarrassed. Well, how deep of a drive do you have to prove you're smart to get a simultaneous MD and PhD with honors from Harvard in anthropology? How deep is that? You think that goes away when they give you the degrees? They don't have enough degrees. This stuff, after a while, it's not coming from the outside. It's the way we look at ourselves, the inside. The second part is, and I want people to get ready to send in some comments, is preserving. Who is the you that you want to keep? What is it about the old you that you don't want to change? You want to preserve, protect. Uh, many people focus so much on creating, we forget about preserving. Classic case study is working. I'm here in New York. Go to Wall Street. You'll see a lot of people who are focused on creating wealth. Unfortunately, you see a few of them, not a few, a lot of them, they sacrifice their marriages, their families, they sacrifice their health. Why? They're so busy creating wealth, they forget to preserve some other things that are maybe even more important than the wealth that they're creating. It's important to have a balance at the same time between creating this exciting new me and preserving this stuff that I want to treasure, protect, value in the past. My friend Francis Hesselbein, probably the greatest leader I've ever met, was CEO of the Girl Scouts. Peter Drucker said the greatest leader you ever met, winner of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, she, I had, uh, she was with me last night for my book party. I just love her. She led the Girl Scouts for 14 years, and she had a motto. It was called Tradition with the Future. Tradition with the Future. She knew she had to change the organization, but she never diminished the past. She always tried to keep the valuable traditions that they had and create a new organization. If you focus too much on preserving, like Kodak or the old IBM, then what happens? You don't create. On the other hand, if you just focus on creating and not preserving, you may lose something that's very important. And by the way, what I want everybody to do is send a little note in right now. What's one element of the new you moving forward that you want to preserve? What is it about the you that's here today that you want to maintain and keep as you move forward that you want to preserve and protect? Send in some notes. And Becky, you can read a few of those. Sure, I have I have some coming in. So uh, Brandy says she wants to keep her strength while giving up controlling behavior. Um, here's someone who wants to be independent um, and wants to preserve that independence, but also be responsive to others. Here's yeah. someone who wants to preserve his compassion for others. Yeah. And uh, someone else who wants to preserve irreverent, unconventional, and goofy behavior, humor. Uh, that person probably wasn't brought up to believe they were the responsible one. Perhaps not. So here's someone else who wants to preserve um, the part of herself that doesn't need to win or be right. Yeah. Someone wants to preserve their energetic disposition, uh, their this creative mind. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I think, again, just focus on me moving forward. Who do I want to create and then what do I want to preserve? Number three is eliminating. What do I want to get rid of? In my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, I think one reason, and that book ended up selling 1.2 million copies. I've done 35 books, and that's sold probably more than the other 34 combined so far. Well, why? Because it teaches people what to stop. And one of the reasons the book was unique is it talked about it eliminating. Peter Drucker said, we spend a lot of time teaching leaders what to do. We don't spend enough time teaching leaders what to stop. He said, half the leaders I meet, they don't need to learn what to do. They need to learn what to stop. Well, as we journey through life, if we just focus on preserving and creating and we don't eliminate, what happens? We become overcommitted. Why? We're just adding more and more and more, saving what we have, and we're not getting rid of anything. Well, as you look at the new you you want to create in the future, don't just think about the me I want to preserve, the me I want to create, think about what do I need to get rid of? What do I need to eliminate in my life? Because without elimination, we can have no creation. 
And then finally, one I'm going to spend a little time, time on is called accepting. This one's one for hard for a lot of people to grasp. It's the negative keep. And you might say, well, why would I have something in life I don't like and keep it? Well, there's an advantage of getting older. As I've grown older, I've realized something. I'm not going to change everything. I'd probably like to save the world for democracy, and I'm not going to, uh, I don't know, cause peace on Earth. There's a lot of things in life. I'm just probably not going to get around to do it. Probably may not cure cancer on this trip through life. There's some things in life that are not particularly positive. We just need to learn to let go of it and realize I'm not going to impact. The great Peter Drucker taught me another wonderful lesson. He said, our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove how smart we are, not to prove how right we are. We're here to make a positive difference, not to prove we're smart and prove we're right. And I'm going to share a little question to ask yourself before you deal with any topic that relates to this good Peter Drucker advice. Am I willing, at this time, to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? If the answer is yes, go for it. If the answer is no, let it go. Now, I'm here in my New York condominium. One of my neighbors for a while was a woman named Lindsay Lohan. How many millions of hours got spent in America with people reading about Lindsay Lohan and worrying about Lindsay Lohan's life? Well, you know, live your own life. Do something where you can make a positive difference. We waste so much time talking about celebrities and politicians and athletes. And, and I've done a lot of research on this with my daughter Kelly, and the research is pretty compelling. The more hours we spend in vicarious living, the less satisfied we are with our lives. The more hours we spend living someone else's life, the less satisfied we are with our own life. You want to live a great life? Live your own life. Don't live the athlete's life, Lindsay Lohan's life, somebody else's life. If you want to live a great life, live your own life. And when you deal with the topic, really, are you going to make a difference? Because the time we waste on things we're not going to change anyway is stolen from the place where we can make a positive difference. So put your energy on that. Am I willing at this time to make the investment required? If the answer is yes, go for it. If the answer is no, take a deep breath and let it go. So finally, this is a model we can use in planning our lives and coaching, even organizations. My friend Vijay Govindaraj, a strategy expert, uses a variation on this. What does a company want to create? What does our company need to preserve? What does our company need to get rid of? And what does our company need to accept? Now, some real quick learning that shows the person matters from six sources. Executive coaching, leadership as a contact sport. My friend Jim Goose is very positive. I've done all kinds of research. Studies we've done on happiness, meaning, and satisfaction. And then finally, active and passive questions. Well, first, coaching. In my coaching, as I said, I don't get paid if I don't get better. What did I learn? In some cases, huge improvement. In other cases, my clients don't change at all. I learned the key variable for successful coaching is not me, the coach. It's the person being coached. I'm the same person. When I coach people now, I say, I don't get paid if you don't get better. And I'll get paid because I'm good. I get paid because you're good. Second source, leadership as a context board. We did a study with 86,000 participants around the world, and every leader in some, most cases went to the same program, taught by the same person, me. They got feedback on the same process at the same time. What we learned, the people who went back to work and actually executed on the plans got better, and the people didn't, didn't. Same program was a key variable to person. By the way, if you'd like a copy of the research, Leadership is a contact sport. Send me an email, marshall at marshallwilson.com. I'll send you a copy of it. And we found that when people went to our programs and did no follow-up, improvement looked minus three to plus three scale, five different companies. Improvement looked a little better than random chance. Basically, they were wasting time. When people did consistent or periodic follow-up, massive improvements. My friend Jim Kuzis and Barry Posner did research on values. And what did they find? The relationship between engagement and values is not, does the company have values? That's almost irrelevant. The key is, can you live your own values? People that felt they're living their own values were engaged. People felt they weren't or were not engaged, regardless of whatever the company is doing. Search on meaning, happiness, and satisfaction. What do we find out there? People that find meaning, happiness, and satisfaction at work tended to find it at home. People who are miserable at work tended to be miserable at home. The correlation was positive 0.63. What does that show? Is the company important in impacting happiness, meaning, and satisfaction? Yes. 
what it shows is the person is equally important, even if the same company and everything else is the same. Now, finally, as promised, I'm going to share something that takes two minutes a day, costs nothing, and helps you get better at almost anything. This is called the daily question process. Now, I'm going to challenge everyone to do this. Get out an Excel spreadsheet. On one column, I want you to write a list of questions. These questions represent what's important in your life. Friends, family, health, business, whatever it is. Seven boxes across, one for every day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Be thinking about this as I talk because I'm going to ask you to send some in. Every question has to be answered with a yes or no or a number. Yes is a one, no is a number. And then at the end of the week, the Excel spreadsheet is going to give you a report card. This is called the daily question process. I've been doing this for years. It'll help you get better at anything. It takes two minutes a day, and it is incredibly difficult to do. I pay a woman to call me up every day to listen to me read my daily questions. 29 questions I read, sometimes 30, sometimes 35, sometimes 18. Every day she listens to me read questions. I wrote the question. I know that I, I provide the answer. Somebody asked me, why do you pay someone to call you on the phone every day just to listen to you read questions you wrote and provide answers you wrote? Don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? I wrote the theory about how to change behavior. That's why I pay women to call me every day. I know how hard it is. You get over 10 million frequent flyer miles, that's an excuse to be a terrible parent. Excuse to be divorced. Oh, that's an excuse to be out of shape. Oh, you get a lot of excuses with those tens, 10 million frequent flyer miles. Excuses don't matter. Why do I pay somebody on the phone every day to call me? Same reason the Hollywood star pays a person to come in that personal trainer every day. If I had the courage and discipline to do this by myself, I would. I don't. Now, I'm going to say something maybe hard to hear. You probably don't either. Very few of us have the courage to do this. I'm going to share some of my questions, but they're not intended to be yours. You want all my questions, send me an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. I'll send you all my questions and an article about the process. One of my questions every day is, how many times yesterday did you try to prove you were right when it was not worth it? I almost never got a zero my whole life. Kind of hard for an old professor not to be right all the time. Now, Becky, can you hear me? I can. Becky, do you occasionally try to be right more than is really useful? Probably, yes. <laughs> Very few people like you or me are going to get a zero on that score. Uh, how many angry or destructive comments did you make about people yesterday? Yikes. <laughs> yeah, you see where I'm going with this? How many minutes did you walk? How many push-ups did you do? Did you say or do something nice for your wife, your son, your daughter, your son-in-law, your grandkids? Just a bunch of questions about life. How many minutes did you write? Uh, Becky, you want to write a book? Yes, I do. Guess what you have to do? I have to write. <sighs> you have to write. Have you ever avoided that before and told yourself you're going to get to it a little bit later? Yes, sir. Well, guess what? Every day start measuring it. You want to do it? Every day start measuring it. It may be painful, but at least it keeps it in your head. Well, my friend Jim Moore, who I'm going to see today, would tell you this saved his life. It didn't kind of save his life or sort of save his life. One of his daily questions is, are you currently updated on your physical exam? The first 90 days he did this, he said no every day. After 90 days, he said, this is embarrassing. i got to get the dumb exam or quit asking a question. He got the dumb exam. What the doctors say? You have cancer. Hmm. My friend Jim is going to be fine. That was years ago. The doctor also said, had you waited seven more months, you'd be dead. He knew he should have got a physical exam. He just didn't do it. Well, you hold this mirror in your face every day, it gets real hard to hide. Now, I'm going to ask everybody to send me in one question for yourself. What is one question you should challenge yourself with every day? And then, Becky, if you don't mind, you can, I love listening to the people talk about their questions. You can read them back because I like to hear people's questions. And maybe it inspires somebody else to do. Maybe you don't want to copy others, but sometimes when you're what others are doing, you think, I'd like to do that too. So have people send in. What's some questions people would challenge themselves with every day? Sure, I have some. So how many minutes did you write? Did you pray today? Have you taken care of yourself today? Have I listened well today? Did I do something to lose weight today? How many times did you say yes when your heart said no? Have I learned something new today? Uh, did I tell my wife I love her today? 
How can I become more aware? How many cards did you send today? How long did you meditate today? Well, let's stop for a second. Sure. Again, the point of this process is not to judge others. One person said, did I pray? A lot of times I work in the Middle East, people say, did I pray five times? Well, it's not my place to say you should or shouldn't pray five times. The goal of this is not to make you be what you don't want to be, it's to help you be what you do want to be. And that one question, I've never heard before, I really love that one. I could, I, they're all great questions. I, obviously, I've heard thousands of people do this. I've heard most of them. So what's that one about, did you say yes when your heart said no? Can you read that one back? I sure can. How many times did you say yes to a request, major or minor, when your heart or mind silently said no, no, no? I love that. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm thinking, whoever sent that one in, thank you very much. Whoever sent that one in, send me an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. Make a note that you sent that question. I'm going to send you a copy of my book. I think I'm going to put that on my own daily question list. It's a good question. It came from my friend Paula. Thank you very much. You just taught me a little something here. Because I think I do that myself. Sometimes I pretty much 100% regret it. Well, that's the daily question process. Now, my daughter taught me something. My daughter Kelly is a professor at the Kellogg School of Northwestern. Um, if you saw the TV show Survivor Africa, she was on Survivor, she went back, got a PhD at Yale, and now she's a professor at the Kellogg School, where she got ranked as one of the nine best business school professors in the world under 40, so daddy's very proud. My daughter taught me the value of asking active questions. Everything in employee engagement has been about a passive question. Do you have clear goals? Do you have meaningful work? Kelly said, try active questions that begin with, did I do my best to? And it's amazing what results we're getting. We did a study comparing active and passive questions. It wasn't even close. Asking yourself active questions made a huge difference. Now, here are my new first six questions every day. And they all begin with, did I do my best to? Number one, did I do my best to be happy? Rather than saying, did somebody else make me happy? Did I do my best to make myself happy? Number two, did I do my best to find meaning? Rather than saying, did someone give me meaning, did I do my best to create meaning myself? Did I do my best to be fully engaged? Rather than saying, did somebody else engage me, did I do my best to engage myself? Did I do my best to build positive relationships, set clear goals, and make progress toward achieving my goals? Did I do my best to every day? Well, it's amazing the results you get when you just ask these six questions every day. Uh, I've done a lot of research. We. And by the way, you're all uh, you're all invited to participate in our research study. If you want to participate in this study, just say um, "active question research." Send me an email, "active question research." I'll sign anybody up who wants to sign up. We'll send you an email every day for 10 working days, and then you're going to get before and after questions a process, and this takes just a couple minutes a day. So far, 79 studies, 2,537 participants have participated in our research. Ten days later, 37% of the people say, just by asking these six questions every day to myself and challenging myself every day, I got better at everything. 65% said I got better at four out of six. 89% said I got better at some. About 11% said no change and 0.4% got worse. Why? Every day these questions get me to focus not on what I cannot change. Every day these six questions get me to focus on what I can change. What I can change. Now, Becky. What I'd like to do is, if you don't mind, we'll have a couple of time for a couple of three questions, and then if you can give me about two or three minutes at the end, I'd like to finish with a closing thought. But for now, before we do that, if anybody has questions, send me in a question, and then Becky, if you could read them back to me. Absolutely. I'll be happy to read back any questions that come in if you want to quickly type those, because I think we only have about six minutes left, and I need to save a couple of minutes for Marshall. Okay. Um, you know, I have a couple of questions while we're waiting for people to type them in. I had a, a couple of folks ask me if you have a template for the question spreadsheet that you mentioned. Yeah, I use an Excel spreadsheet. If you'd like to see it, send me an email. I'll, I'll send one to you. I'll okay, send one. super. Yeah. Uh, so here's the first question. Uh, Marshall, do you, believe in the uncon do you believe the unconscious mind plays a role? Let me tell you what I think in terms of triggers. The typical psychology talk is there is a trigger, it produces an impulse which produces behavior. By learning discipline, there is a trigger, it still produces an impulse. If we can learn to stop and slow down, then we realize I achieve awareness, I have a choice, and then I engage in the behavior. 
It takes discipline to do this because I like your term unconscious mind. Most of the time we live with the unconscious mind. There is a trigger, it produces an impulse and I act in a certain way without ever thinking. One of my daily questions is, what percent of the day were you conscious? I might average 50. I'm probably being overly generous with myself at that. Most of us are really unconscious a lot of the day. We just we go through life just reacting to what's around us without really ever consciously thinking. So does our unconscious mind play a role? Yeah, I'd say most of the time it plays the role. So excellent question. Next. Uh, sure. So um, Jennifer's wondering if you would repeat an example of a passive question versus an active question. Okay. Passive question is, do you have meaningful work? An active question is, do you do your best to find meaning? Passive question, do you have clear goals? An active question, did you do your best to set clear goals? Passive question, do you have a friend at work? An active question, did you do your best to build positive relationships? Okay, that makes sense. Um, so I have a couple of people asking, Marshall, if you can't afford a coach or if you can't afford to pay someone to call you every day, what um, suggestions might you have? And you know, if you could maybe afford one call a week, how would you structure that one call? So quite a few people are asking this question. Number one. <laughs> To pay somebody to call you every day for two minutes really is not a big price uh, price topic. You probably pay some kid to do this for five dollars and they do it, be happy to do it. So this is not a price issue. You can afford what I do is not expensive at all. This is something anybody can afford. On the other hand, if you want to get help and you don't want to get a coach, number one, peer coaching is great. Find a peer coach. Someone who you help them and they help you and you do a fair trade. I don't think to do the stuff I talk about in triggers. You need some kind of real world authority to be your coach. I think what you need is just another human being holds a mirror in front of your face every day. That makes a lot of sense. So I think, Marshall, that we only have about three minutes left. I wanted to let everyone know that I did put Marshall's email address and my email address in the chat window so that you can find those. A lot of people are asking Marshall about the resources that we're going to provide. I'm going to send a follow-up email that will include the slides and a link to the recording. And I'm going to summarize a lot of the resources that Marshall offered and mentioned. Um, and Marshall, uh, before you do your wrap-up statement, I do have the opportunity today to give away 20 books. And what Wonderful. I'm looking for is meaningful feedback from you about this event at my email address, which is in the chat window, except that's not my email address. Oh my goodness. I don't know what I was doing. I was working from my unconscious mind. Uh, my email address is actually Becky at weavinginfluence.com and I'm putting it in the chat window now. So we're going to take the first 20 people who send meaningful feedback about this event and we're going to ship out a book to you. Um, in appreciation of your being here live for this event. So uh, Marshall's email address and my email address are both in the chat window. If you use Becky at BeckyRobinson.com, it won't work. It doesn't exist. So uh, now to you for the close, Marshall. Final advice. Take a deep breath. Uh, Imagine you're 95 and you're just ready to die. You're on a deathbed. Here comes your last breath. But before you take the last breath, you're given a wonderful gift, the ability to go back in time and talk to the person listening to me right now. But what advice would that wise old person have for the you that's listening to me now? Well, some friends of mine, they interviewed old folks who were dying, got to ask this question, three themes come up. Number one, be happy now. Not next week, not next month, not next year, be happy now. Number two, do whatever you can to help people. The main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status or getting ahead. The main reason to help people is much deeper than 95 year old you'll be proud of because you did and disappointed if you don't. If you don't think that's true, interview any CEO who has retired. I've interviewed very many and asked them a question. What are you proud of? None told me how big their office was. All they ever talked about is people they helped. And the final advice, go for it. Your world's changing, your industry's changing, do what you think is right. You might not win, but at least you tried. Old people, we almost never regret the risk we take and fail. We always regret the risk we fail to take. And the final thing I would like to say is um, my mission is just kind of help you have a little better life. I hope maybe something you heard today help you have a little better life or someone around you have a little better life. So thank you very much. Marshall, thanks so much for sharing your uh, incredible value with us today. For those of you who are on the call, I want to encourage you to go out today and buy copies of this new book, Triggers, Becoming the Person You Want to Be. And uh, I look forward to uh, more chances to learn with you in the future, Marshall. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Bye-bye.